I'm Cara Jarrett. I'm with Hypothesis, and it is my great honor to introduce you to Professor Jelana Enteen. She is with Northwestern University. She's a professor of instruction in gender and sexuality studies, Asian American studies, and Asian studies program. She also started the Northwestern University Digital Humanities Lab, known as Noodle. So we're really lucky to have her here. She has a great session for you. Please, if you have any questions, add them in the chat, add them in Q&A. We'd be happy you know, to have you join us. So I'll kick it over to Jelana. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Cara. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be with you today to, dis to discuss social networks through hypothesis. I have really enjoyed using it because I have found that it gets students involved in very low stake assignments and it also allows them to get to be much better writers. So I'm going to sh go over today in a, a kind of series of um, an overview. Uh, my introduction is going to be short. My anecdotes are from students and other professors, as well as myself. My comparison is a social networking platform that I that the students actually tell me that it's like. Then I'll show you my assignment and my grading. And then I have a slew of examples. So I hope during the examples, rather than me just showing them, which I'll never get through all of them, you will also um, ask me what you're interested in. And that way I can tailor the session for the people here and their interests. Okay. So, well, my introduction is a bit, there's nobody here. Um, Please stop me also at any time if you have specific questions about details of my slides. As there's always the Q&A at the end. There's certainly the Q&A during examples, but I would much more um, enjoy hearing what you're thinking along the way. So let's start off with some anecdotes. Okay, so this is my current class. I'm teaching this class and I don't have, um, hypothesis in it. In this class, there were two students, there are four students from my last class. Two of the students raised their hand when I said, we're gonna be working on the DSM-5 and close reading um, the gender dysphoria um, passages. So come to class having read this very carefully. So two students from my winter quarter raised their class, raised their hands at exactly the same time. And then they both looked at each other and laughed. So I called on one and that person said, I really, really want you to put this on hypothesis because I know I'm gonna have so much to say and I wanna start saying it when I'm reading it. I don't wanna to have to take notes and start the discussion in class. And then I called on the other student who started laughing and saying, that's exactly what I want. So rather than making the whole class have to sign up for hypothesis, I just opened it up in a, in a non graded assignment. And I said, whoever wants to do this can do this. So the two students that raised their hands simultaneously started the class. And if you look at my arrow, you'll see that they had 15 notes on something that they asked me to do in order to share with each other how they were reading through um, the, the gender dysphoria, which can, you know, it's rough to be critiquing something in the DSM-5 by the American Psychological Association. It ended up working out really great for me because through this, they kind of ended up leading the class. Some of the students had read their comments. Those that hadn't, it didn't matter because these two students were ready and all of a sudden it made the class a more equal space rather than me saying, okay, everybody go up to the board and do what they wanna do because these students were prepared and excited. Okay, so this is a, um, another anecdote from a student in fall quarter who says, I don't ever not know how to approach a text. Uh, I gotta move the box because I can't even read it. Um, Anyway, um, oh, oh, this came from a course evaluation. Um, if I don't know what's going on, I can just define something or suggest a thesis. I come back a few hours later and use other students' comments to isolate the part of a text and carefully close read. And then I give multiple replies as a form of gratitude. Your basic number of three per reading is often something I exceed and I trust these students in class because of our social annotated conversations. 
Now that is the best kind of student evaluation you can get. Um, and it, it's funny because I, I was gonna stop using hypothesis. I started during COVID and I was gonna stop using it. And when I get something like this, it makes me know that I need to make it available in every class. My next anecdote, my next anecdote is from a student who um, has been in three of my classes. And it, it, this was actually written all in caps, but also told to me like daily, social annotation makes me feel like my classmates are friends. Um, I think that they do a lot of stuff outside of class in the smaller group this winter. Um, I think they just went to see Judith Butler and it was really the social annotations that created them having a tech group together and doing activities like seeing movies and going to the Chicago Humanities Festival to see something related to the class, even when the class is over. I have two anecdotes from faculty. The first is from my colleague, Professor Casey Evans, who's the DGS in the English department, as well as a fantastic teacher. And her feeling about hypothesis is that her students have moved from coming to class saying, uh, I like the reading, um, I like the passage, which is not the best way to start an English class that's really about engaging from the get-go. So she feels that students put their, put their thoughts up without worrying. She does not have a structured assignment, just a requirement that they post. And they don't do the fillers. They don't worry about formality. It's just open, but they have to post one thing. When they come to class, they come, as she's quoting, with pointed questions about the reading and things to say about particular class passages rather than, I liked it, which is one of the things that really slows down getting the class going. Um, another colleague who decided to remain anonymous said, beyond teaching, it has helped me think. I have started putting my primary sources I teach into the classroom and making her own notes. So through hypothesis, she's doing her own research. And sometimes she makes notes just for herself about moments in the text. And sometimes she moves it into the class itself and has students, mostly graduate students, uh, see what she's saying and then make notes responding to her text. This was a really exciting thing to learn. And it's something I plan on doing in the future. Um, I, I think it's a, an awesome idea to start with the prompts of what I think about something and have students respond. So this isn't even part of my general point about social networking for students. It's a point about what it might do for your own work while you're teaching, which is you know, always a problem to try to teach and do research. Now I'm gonna move on to my analogy. Um, and what I realized uh, before this talk was uh, you guys not, might, may not use Be Real. I think it's kind of going out of um, popularity with students, but about two years ago, it was really important. And I think part of that was a response to TikTok and Instagram requiring people to be so perfect. And instead with Be Real, it just tells you at some point you're supposed to take a picture. They don't do it in class, but they do it a lot. Um, my students for the past couple of years have asked me to join their Be Real. And if you look, you can see I'm a horrible Be Real member. Um, I very rarely post, but when I do, it's always pictures of my dog. And that's all my students wanna see. So Be Real is like a not particularly comfortable for me to be seeing my students not Be Real, but this kind of instant connection that's very vulnerable, which is always a picture of you and a picture of something else, is the best analogy that I can think of for um, how hypothesis lets them, quote unquote, be real without having to worry about um, doing something wrong, because it's really about that moment of sharing and putting yourself up there in a group rather than the tendency to just have to be the smart kid in the room, even if you didn't have time to do the whole reading or even if you didn't understand what was going on. So this be real idea, I think is very, very important when we're thinking about difficult texts. And, and a lot of my classes have difficult theory or things like the DSM that are hard, particularly if that gender dysphoria is something that engages you to not have the preparation and the comfort of social annotation before you walk into the classroom. Okay, 
And now I wanna focus on exactly how I assign it. Um, I have this um, hypothesis annotations description um, and you're welcome to have it from me. But if you look at it, you'll see that I will put page notes up and sometimes guiding questions. And then all they have to do is join the three links I got straight from Hypothesis team members. And I have the assignment that has three particular annotations that must be viewable for the entire class. I know that students do a lot of highlighting in their own annotations, and they will download that and save that so that they have a record of what they like when they read this during the class. But the three requirements for every reading, and normally there's two readings per class, are to find the thesis or provide a definition or challenge a statement. It's very low stakes. And I have to talk to them and tell them, if you look something up, I promise you other people are looking it up too. So you're doing a social service. You're networking, no matter what the, no matter how stupid you think it is, don't be embarrassed, you're being helpful. The second one is the content one. It's a close reading. And that is kind of the skills that I'm asking from most of my classes. So I ask them to quote a phrase or the, at most a sentence, and then really think about the language use and think about what's being said. And that ends up be, a lot of times being the methodology that they have to use for their midterms and final papers. So I won't penalize them if they don't do a great close reading, as long as they try. But I will sometimes help, and I will also say, oh, wow, this close reading that we all saw by this dot our student who gets mentioned um, is really going to help when it comes down to the paper. That work has already been done. Um, I also do try to bring in the hypothesis contributions. And if somebody is falling behind, I will reach out to them through the learning management system and just say, hey, you know, you're falling behind. So we can talk about this. Does anyone have any questions? Not yet? No, okay. I don't see any so, come in. Okay, so if you wanna talk more about how, why I have the logic of this assignment, we can talk about it later. But if you look at number three, this is the thing that really breaks down the barriers and makes this a social networking project. You have to do a response to a comment. You can do a response thanking someone for defining something. You can challenge someone. And these will, I'll give you a lot of examples at the end. But I also stress, this is not formal. And this effort to make a reply to another student's comment will lead to the seminar experience where you actively find friendship and, and forge academic inquiry. I have added that on later because I know it to be true. At the beginning, I was just like, be social, be kind. But it is something where they forge friendships and they're in a comfortable spot. So the first two, they have to do the day before we meet. And the third one, they had, well, actually on this version, I said 9 a.m. the day of class because class met at 3.30 but that gives people time to do the reply. And it also, because they have to do it separately, ensures that they are reviewing the text a second time before they come to class. So while I don't say that at all in there, the reply function has allowed my students to have to revisit, not just do it once, come to class and forget it, but do it once, revisit it close to class time to give their reply. And then they come in with a lot of pressure. Um, ideas. So I am not only creating a social network, I'm cre creating prepared students that don't need to remember things. And I've advanced, as my colleague said, particularly Casey Evans, I've advanced their thinking because this conversation with kind of low stakes and their networking has already prepared them. And I can start kind of two thirds of the way into where before I used hypothesis, I would start, which would be like, okay, take two minutes, find the theses, remember the thing, pair, share, whatever. I don't have to do that anymore. Okay, I think I was getting tricky with myself here. Okay, I wanna highlight that I actually, this is 25% of the grade. So participation, which means coming to class, which is always a challenge post COVID, is 25%, but that participation means they have to speak or ask questions. 
the other 25% is simply completing these, doing your annotation. But while it's 25%, okay, this is so funny, you will see in my grade book, and this comes straight out of the um, Canvas learning management system grading software, every assignment is out of three points. So because there's two assignments a day, you know, it, we're talking about maybe uh, 50 readings. So students can feel free to miss one. And every once in a while I do, if, if you see the third one in, every once in a while I actually give three points. And that's probably every third to fifth, sixth reading so that they can actually see that I'm assessing the quality. So when you look to the person that was excused twice, they were having a hard quarter and didn't get the um, any um, credit for the Sedgwick and the Butler. They also got credit, a partial credit for doing a reply, but not a post. So every once in a while I do those detailed assessments. One thing I will say that is a challenging with hypothesis is if you use speed grader, the replies don't show up. So I normally, like the one where I do the checks when I can see that they posted because what I'm doing before class is not grading. I'm going to the actual um, the actual content in order to better plan my class. So if Hypothesis was gonna do something better, it would be able to actually let me see the replies as well as the posts in grading. Um, but, and so you can see I use the speed grading, but that doesn't mean that I don't have to go back for the ones that I've waited. Okay, so now I'm at this section of examples. Um, I have a whole bunch of them and I'm really happy to share them, but I also love to hear the moments that you all wanna hear more about. Kevin Hunt so. from the audience actually just mentioned, he said students could tag their replies as reply to help with that as well. And then can I see that? I mean, they always say reply. Would that go into the grade book? Kevin, if you are able to respond in the chat, that would be great. We can take a look. Um, if I, I go to chat, I think I'm going to have a hard time seeing my slides. He said, gonna um, don't worry. He, oh, he said, um, no, but would it be easier to find the replies, I think. Um, OK, so I, I don't really have to mark it because everybody does the replies. That's the easiest thing. Um, and now in the middle of my screen is, I'm gonna exit this. I'm gonna escape the um, PowerPoint for a second so that I can um, move it. No, it's not gonna let me. Okay, um, so thank you for that tip. Um, I, I do wish though the reply would show up in the gradebook part because like I said, it's only every five times that I'm gonna go through and check. The replies seem to be so easy for people. If they're doing nothing else, they're gonna give me a reply. And that's also kind of easy in the grading because then I, I can actually give the one, but they love the reply. It's the close reading that sometimes I don't get. Um, so this slide, you, you can see um, that I am just giving a little comment. Okay, the bibliography is my page note. And then please note, that the section by Lugonus is optional. I do a lot of those, like please focus on this or please do that. But I try to give a page note that is not just the bibliography, which clearly is right there on the left, right? But also giving them a little bit of directive towards each reading. But I don't wanna give them too much because I feel like the hypothesis three points are really where I want them to spend their time. Um, one. Um, okay, I can't see because of um, the chat box. I can't actually see what I wrote. Oops. Um, but I think it's about responses and growth. Because if you look at these particular ones, you'll see that people agree with this fully and let's push this first. And um, I agree. And I think this is getting to the heart of the thesis claim. But really, all Aaron's done at the beginning is not really know what to do and name the thesis. And as a result, there's a generative um, 
there's a generative activity going on. And I actually counted something like N Nicola's reply as constitutive because he's doing a lot of work with this. Um, I think the biggest point about this slide is people push each other, other further and they're not just acting like cheerleaders. And um, that's normally a little bit later into the quarter when they trust the system a bit more, but it's the cheerleading, thank you for this, that's more about with definitions. So I do wanna push that the replies are ended up, the responses that, uh, in the reply section show growth. Okay, and then the next slide I wanted to talk about that there's, not sometimes I feel the need to get involved um, because somebody is just confused. So this is in a grad student class where somebody is just like, what is the context of appropriation of lesbian? And so in, a, in this in this time, I decided to give the context because I know they're going to go back and do replies and see it. I'm much more careful, particularly in a larger undergraduate class, not to talk too much because that kind of disrupt the students doing the social networking that I value so much. But you will see that there are times at the beginning where I will single out good close reading, good close reading. Um, I try to, in general, I try to bring that more back into the class and say there was this great discussion between the following three students. Let's move from what they said further. But every in the grad class, when somebody's really asking the question, I'm always there to answer and and careful not to disrupt the um, social bonding. And I try not to be formal. That's listed in my bullet, but I'm really trying just to type it very quickly so I can stay at the level of not being all academic or diff difficult, which in some, time, some ways it's easier to write that way. So I'm, work, I'm conscientiously um, being very informal when I do reply. Okay, so this one is um, close reading, successful writing. Oh, I, I was kind of using this as an example of um, ungrading, which I'm sure many of you are discussing in your institutions. I dutifully attended my ungrading workshop and I realized, oh, I've been doing that since I've been using hypothesis. Sometimes you get the one, two, or three, sometimes you get the completion. And then sometimes you can really take this successful writing without a letter grade. It, this is a terrific response by Ferd, right? He's only gotten a completion, but it's such good work I'm getting without the pressure of, oh, she's going to assess my close reading. Now, when they write a midterm, I am gonna say, how, how could you have done more? But the general 50% of the class is simply annotations and attending class and talking. So a, you can control a lot of your grades um, in this kind of ungrading or non-punitive framework. Um, this one is sometimes I kind of cheerlead and I say, you know, you try to read carefully and with a question, if you've done your best and you're just not sure that you really understood what you're talking about, and guaranteed you're gonna help your peers because then they're gonna have a place to start when they can't start. So this was a, a reading that they all really loved, but for some reason they felt it was a little difficult. And I think that Carter was really su successful with ending the post with the questions. What do y'all think? Is what Johnson is proposing queer theory can accomplish, is what he's proposing, can it actually be possible? And then he got several re replies that were also careful close readings by, by instead of acting sure, acting following up with questions. And it really is true. If you ask a careful question, it helps the other students become a thoughtful peer. Um, okay, so this example is where they all of a sudden are putting these readings together. This, the, um, Reading is talking about the future of queer theory and the challenge, you can see the green one, the need to challenge the assumption of heteronormativity in every aspect of their existence. So what this, the way that the students responded was the first one was kind of personal and then it grew, right? And people can always rethink. 
So we have two people responding, kind of throwing something out there, and they know that's not the same as doing it in class where you put yourself out and you're supposed, everybody's gonna respond like, oh my gosh, that's what you really believe? Because in the hypothesis forum, when students stand, they don't feel like they have to stay where they stood. So they can walk in the class and say, oh, I can't believe what I wrote. And after thinking about it and looking at it again, I have a completely different stance. So this is the practice moment of kind of finding your voice but it's non-putative and it's not everybody listening to you. You're able to put yourself at risk and immediately dismiss it, but you don't even have to delete it, right? You just come to class and say something else. Okay, now we have um, the easiest low stake, wonderful um, comments. I assigned uh, Blood Child by Octavia Butler. Um, some students did not understand it from the get-go, even though I had given them a setup. And other students found really interesting things that changed the course of the whole discussion. So by um, in this one, Charlie was literally noticing that this one name was a European name. And then you can see that Isabel said, I was looking for that. Thank you for looking it up. And Charlie's like, of course, none of that counts, but they're so supporting each other. And then Pirong is normally a very, self-conscious student. And after that conversation happened, Parang didn't have any problem saying, I'm confused. How many siblings does the narrator have? Right? And there's also a whole discussion after Charlie named this European name that so many of the other names came from other places and the students were looking it up. And I came in learning so much from them and was able to do a kind of post-colonial reading I'd never considered before just because they were confused and finding other ways to do the requirement and have this conversation. So my whole ability to discuss this novel, I, I do it better now from what happened by people just being confused. And I can change how I would normally do it in response to things they found out that I didn't even notice. I know we're almost okay, so, at time. I just, I just wanted to see, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. I know love I've, I've loved seeing the psychological safety as well and the students just feeling more comfortable being able to express themselves in these examples. And I know you referred to psychology earlier and I was just like, it's just a safe place where you can, you know, feel like make your point. If you're wrong, you're wrong. You can address it in class. It's just, it's nice for the students to have that place to do so. And indeed with the DSM, one student actually had had that diagnosis so it's very invested. And the other student is uh, doing a senior thesis about DSM and medical practices. So these are the two most invested students able to talk things out in such a way that they're not even threatening each other. And they're coming from very different perspectives, one kind of an endorsement and the other from a personal perspective. And then I get a, a window on their, on their work. And then they really kind of decided to get up in front of the class and with pens in their hand and start making some notes for everybody else. So it really can switch the classroom and nobody seems to get mad at each other on hypothesis, whereas touchy subjects like the DSM are places where you can really hurt some feelings um, by not being sensitive to people that are involved in different ways. I totally agree. I totally agree. And it also seems like they're coming to class more engaged for discussion. You know, they've already Absolutely. felt comfortable to say their thoughts, but now they know what they can talk about and they know their other peers' thoughts as well. Right. And they've reviewed it twice, not just once before walking in the class. Replies. Exactly. Awesome. I'll go ahead and put up these last couple of examples. I, I only got a couple more. Um, and then I would just love anybody's before we end, just like ask me anything, tell me something. I really appreciate that noting grading help with replies, um, share with me. Um, this one is just, I can't believe over the course of the quarter, how much better the students are writing and how much easier it is for them to write final papers. Uh, and I can't help it. This is just a, an example of like somebody who hated close reading at the beginning, coming up with something that could actually be half a paper. 
without thinking about it, just writing it off the cuff. Um, this is something where when every once in a while I need to reach out and in situations like this where there's a discussion going on, it's a little uncomfortable, I won't reply here. I will go ahead and just use a personal email or the LMS to talk about, um, okay, so you're, you're, you're being complimentary, but I can tell there's something else going on. I also do that when I get those non-posts or just a reply. I will say, hey, what's going on? You know, everybody wants to hear from you. Um, and this was something the student really didn't have a way to deal with the reading. So rather than trying to do the close reading assignment, they did a different way of responding to the text, right? That it's bullet points looking at the word atomizing. And that's, it was a great comment, but her response in class was, I didn't know how to close read. This was just too hard for me. And yet what I got from it was a very smart answer. And then I think I only have one more, which is um, Kaylin just put out a bunch of ideas and gave, and people gave other readings. So in the course of the assignment, because they were having a hard time with this particular text, they were tying into previous. So um, we were reading, I think we were reading um, Jose Munez and Butler and De Laredes and Delaney were previous readings and the students were using those readings to help them unpack the text that they found too difficult. So those are the kinds of connections you really want. And because they're faced with something they don't understand, they're pulling from things they've learned, making it a very much more cohesive class. Um, that's pretty much what I have. Please let me know if there's anything more I can say. This was incredible. You ha really have such great examples of the impact in so many different ways from you know, having more inclusive learning environments where you mentioned the student that doesn't usually speak up in class, but he kind of annotates more here and was asking questions um, to the psychological safety, to the making friends and connections with the classmates. These ex examples are incredible. Yeah. And, and also I would say this is 25% in class participation is 25% so for those students who don't want to talk they have a way to have 100% of their grade and just like say one thing in class. And for those students who love to talk, they have a way to have a conversation here and in class. So it, it, it works on different styles of learning. Amazing, awesome. I'm gonna open the floor up. Any questions from our attendees, you can add it to the chat or the Q&A. I'm looking at my chat now. We have a lot of thank yous. Thank you for the great information. So, well, thank you all so much. You. Um, you know, you know where to find us. Jelana is in her information is in the uh, speaker portion of the navigation. If you ever want to reach out to questions, uh, and thank you so much, Jelana, for being here. We're so grateful, and we love all these examples. So, thank you for sharing them. Absolutely. Thank you guys for coming and. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to talk about this. Um, have a great day. Thank everyone. you all. Thanks. Take care.